Thank you. Of course, you know that Silke has a conflict of interest because she's part of the same group. So <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to believe her praise. Um, yes, well, I guess before I go to today and the future, I'd like to give a little, little historical uh, analogy because I really believe that there are periods in history where things accelerate. Uh, I've just been reading a book which I keep raving about. It's called The First European Revolution. It's a really fantastic book that really shows how the 11th century uh, saw an extraordinary acceleration um, and actually the, the actual creation of what we call feudalism. Until the 10th century, Europe was still living under the Roman system. The, the, the structures of antiquity were actually still there in the 10th century. Masters, free men, and slaves. Um, by the 11th century, we see the start of the feudal system with masters and serfs and the clergy on the side. Um, and just, just a little anecdote. So this um, is a bit lesser known than the Magna Carta, but you know, the, the 11th century is both the, the birth of hierarchical law, the law of feudalism, but also of anti-hierarchical law, the law of the free cities and, and uh, commoners' protection. Um, so imagine, uh, the, you know, the Roman Empire went down, and in the 8th century, Charlemagne tries to recreate the Roman Empire, and it doesn't work. So he divides it up in three for his three sons, and that doesn't work either. So we have, in the 9th century, the period of castellization, and it's really a period of total warfare, of permanent warfare between barons and the castles are not just a way to fight each other, but also a way to exploit the farmers. So they, they rape, they pillage, they steal church goods, and it's really a, a period of social breakdown. And it's that period that the monks of Cluny, uh, followed by the people, the, the farmers, uh, you know, with, with the Virgin Mary uh, up front, start confronting the feudals with their sins, basically. You know, in a period where everybody is a believer, this was a very powerful way of demonstrating. And so at that time, they sign in, you know, hundreds of cities in France what's called the Peace of God Charters, which establish that basically for the feudals, make love, uh, yeah, make love, not war. So, you know, don't fight each other, marry each other. They install primogeniture, which is the inheritance for the firstborn son. So there's no more infighting in the family. And if you want to grow, well, you know, you marry off your son to some, some other baron's uh, daughter. So it kind of pacifies uh, feudalism to uh, a certain degree. And uh, it also creates all these city charters, which, you know, which allow then the cities to grow uh, as well. So this was a period of acceleration of history, right? Of acceleration in which these new types of law were established in a very short period of time. I think we probably could say, although I'm not an historian, that the 16th century was also uh, such a period, you know, after the consolidation of the Italian city-states, the printing press, the Templars inv uh, invent or reinvent double book uh, entry accounting, uh, the invention of purgatory so that Christians can lend money and not go to hell, uh, Calvinism, you ca if you get rich, it's because you actually are chosen. Uh, so all these are the ideological, pragmatic, inventions become the basis of our capitalist society and, and, and also the creation of all these new private law tradition, right? Uh, and I really believe that we are living and going through the same type of period. We are living a period of civic constitutionalism or societal constitutionalism in which new type of productive communities which are in an exodus, if you like, of the present dysfunctional system start establishing new practices, new norms, and new legal forms. And Dave has done a really good job uh, of outlining 10 of those fields that, you know, in which we can see this. So let me just start by telling you that, so I see three new institutions emerging from what we call commons-based peer production. So what is peer production? It's the capacity that people now have to create value together, to self-organize, and to create shared resources, uh, knowledge commons, design commons, software commons, and to create economies around it, to create livelihoods around these shared resources. 
you, you do, don't have to believe me, but there is a, an American report that says that the economy around shared knowledge resources is 16% of GDP and involves 70 million workers. Of course, these are not all open source uh, communities. There is, for example, you know, all the open geography, which has been given by the American state to the public. So this is not a, a resource that was constructed as an open source community, but which was subsequently donated and made into a commons. You know, creates a huge economy around it, right? There's a shared resource and it creates uh, an economy around it. So three great insti three institutions are now being born. Uh, just as, you know, primogeniture was born in the 10th century, uh, we have three institutions that generate their own legal practices and their own rules and norms. So I want to give you, uh, the first one is, I call them global open design communities. Um, global design com communities are communities that are using networks to create a shared resource and that protect this resource with a license, right? So all these licenses, the general public license, the Creative Commons license, are examples of new law, of commons law. This is the social charter, like the city charters of the Middle Ages, which created the freedoms of the cities and created the community, right? With a wall around it and say, if you live here, the power of the Lord stops, right? The, the feudal Lord has to recognize our rights as citizens in the city. Today we have these licenses which say, if you follow these four rules, you're part of our community and this cannot be enclosed. The privatizers cannot come in our community and enclose our common resources. I think this is a very powerful modern form of what we've seen uh, with the Magna Carta. You know, think about the readme files that are used in open hardware or the facts or the social charters like the Debian constitution. These are all affirmative commons law that didn't exist 15 years ago and that's being reimagined uh, to suit uh, contemporary uh, needs. Um, the second institution that is born today, I call them entrepreneurial coalitions. And I don't know if Inspiral is here. Are you here, Alana? No? Yes? This is one of the great examples in the world. It's called Inspiral. It's an entrepreneurial coalition of 250 social entrepreneurs that also create Lumio, which is a global open source democratic decision-making system, and something called CoBudget, which is an open source software for reinvesting community resources in the further growth uh, of the livelihood uh, around these, these commons. Uh, one of the great innovations, remember the Templars with double book accounting? Well, today we have something called contributory accounting. It's a very important innovation. If you have an open source community, I give a very simple example. I work with Guerrilla Translation, which is a collective that translates common text from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. You know, maybe eight, nine, ten people do that. They're quite small. Well, by doing that, they create social capital, right? But then this guy comes along, David Bollier, and says, well, maybe you can translate my book. So this is the worm in the apple, right? Because what David is doing by paying these two people who are going to create this, translate this book, two people are going to extract value on the market based on the value that has been collectively created by 10 people over a long period of time, right? So there is an issue here of value extraction of some people who are between the commons and the market taking more than the fair share of value. So contributory accounting is a way to, to deal with that. There are very complex systems around, like the ones by Sensorica, but the one in Guerrilla Translation is very simple to explain. Basically, all the pro, no, pro bono translations are counted character by character and go in a second accounting. And the people who are engaged in the market give, I don't know if it's 10 or 15%, of the income generated by the market to the second accounting system, which means that the people who have contributed get a fair reward for their work, right? I'm not sure how Inspiral does it. There's another uh, entrepreneurial coalition that I like a lot. It's called Ethos Foundation. In the Ethos Foundation, what happens is that there is also an accounting for the market, 
so people who directly generate income for the community get the income from the market, and the people who generate value for the community but not directly in the market, but actually strengthen the community, get virtual shares in a second equity, right? And I'm not sure what they're gonna do with it, but I think at some point they're gonna sell this second equity form, and so the people, the contributors will also get their fair shares. Now, I don't know if these will work in the long term, I'm just trying to show you the kind of innovation that is going on in these communities. They're not just applying accounting as we know it. They are reinventing accounting. They're bringing something new uh, to the field. Um, in terms of licenses, um, uh, one interesting uh, innovation I just heard about, just to give you an example. So one of the things that we work on in the P2P Foundation is called a copy fair uh, license. And the reason we, we work on this is because it's the same issue, really. Commoners create value to collectively, and then private players extract the value and do not necessarily reinvest in this collective value creation. And so we have a paradox. If you have a totally open license, I'm gonna give it a provocative uh, name, the more communistic your license, the more capitalistic your practice. Because it means if you're totally open that IBM can come in and start commercializing on a large scale and then effectively dominates that economy. And this is happening, this is the standard actually in the open source economy. So uh, the copy fair would be a license that totally preserves the freedom to share the knowledge, that's totally preserved, so there is no restriction on sharing the knowledge, but it restricts the right to commercialize the commons to people who reciprocate to the community and the commons. Now, it doesn't exist yet, but there's a really innovative solution that was just found by the Fair Shares Association. And the Fair Shares Association is also interesting. It's a, a new way of considering equity that says there are four types of shares for the founders, the entrepreneurs who have worked for years to make it possible to create this new thing, the funders, the workers, and the users. Because today, in the network economy, the users actively contribute to the value of any uh, initiative. And the Fair Shares Association has found a creative way to use the Creative Commons licenses. On the outside, they use the non-commercial license. So everybody can use their commons. Everybody can use their knowledge, can build on the knowledge, can improve the knowledge, so it's not enclosed at all. But the commercialization, the commercial version, the commercial license is reserved for the members of the association. So again, you have to contribute to uh, use that license. I'm just giving you as examples of showing you how you know, th these productive communities are actively innovating uh, rules and norms and, and creating new legal realities. Um, the third one, the third institution is the Floss Foundation. Uh, so you probably noticed that most of these projects have foundations. The Wikimedia Foundation, the Linux Foundation, um, which is usually democratic institutions which maintain the infrastructure of cooperation. Okay, four minutes. Okay, let me just give you a very quick uh, idea of what I'm excited about for the moment. Um, one is the surge, surge, S-U-R-G-E, of meta-economic networks. So we're all familiar that fab labs are exponentially growing, hacker spaces, co-working spaces, um, urban gardening, uh, energy cooperative, especially here in Germany, and but also in the Netherlands and Belgium and other countries. Uh, so we see that people are actively recreating new economies. There's no question about it. And there is a famous Dutch graphic. You see the growth of civic and cooperative initiatives until 2005, which is slowly growing, and then in 2005 it's just exponential. So, you know, this is not an invention. This is uh, happening everywhere. And um, so I'm very excited about the fact that these people are now starting to talk to each other, right? Simon Sarrazin, are you here? No? You didn't show? Oh, there you are. So that's one example. 
encommun.org and Unisson in Lille in northern France, um, where Simon and his friends are trying to create an economic network around commons institutions and commons business, commons oriented businesses. So the idea is not just to have the food co-op and the credit union and the time bank, but to actively connect them to each other uh, and to make them into you know, a feedback, uh, growing feedback system where they can strengthen each other. Maybe we can use our time bank dollars to get a loan for a community land trust with a credit union, right? This is the idea. Maybe we can use the stamps, I'll be very quick, um, that we get in the food co-op to do something with the time bank. So the idea of creating these flows of value, and of course to do that we need governance, property, lots of rules and norms need to be invented and, and tried out to make that work. Last thing, platform cooperatives. Um, today we have Uber, we have Airbnb. Um, they serve, in my view, a useful function because they mutualize in their own way idle resources that we couldn't have access to before. But they do that by extracting value from the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And you know, having a, a, a Uber in your city is like having a supermarket, right? 30% of the value leaves your community and goes outside to the banks and to the shareholders in Silicon Valley. So I think one of the really important priorities is to create platform cooperatives so that you know, the people who actively create the value also create a, their own platform so they can reinvest the value in the commons and in commons-oriented livelihoods. One more thing, Silke, I'm finished. I always play this trick, she knows me. We need voice, right? We need voice. So what we need to do today is also making sure that the policy world and the political world know what we're doing and know what our needs are. So I have suggested some years ago, and it's taking on uh, a life now, assemblies and chambers of the commons, that all the commoners in the locality form an assembly where they can get to know each other, understand their concerns, and make proposals, if not demands, to the political world that this is what we need to live and grow and Chamber of the Commons for all the entrepreneurial coalitions, but at the local level, who create ethical livelihoods around these common and shared resources, that they also uh, create a voice, because the Chamber of Commons is not going to do it for you. Thank you.